This land is your land, this land is my land From California to the New York Islands From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water This land was made for you and me As I was walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me that endless skyway I saw below me that golden valley This land was made for you and me I've roamed and I've rambled And I've followed my footsteps To the sparkling sands of her diamond deserts And all around me a voice was sounding This land was made for you and me When the sun came shining and I was strolling and the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds rolling as fog was lifting a voice was chanting this land was made for you and me as I went walking I saw a sign there and on the sign it said no trespassing but on the other side it didn't say nothing that side was made for you and me In the squares of the city In the shadow of a steeple By the relief office I seen my people As they stood there hungry I stood there asking Is this land made for you and me? Nobody living Can ever stop me as I go walking that freedom highway Nobody living can ever make me turn back This land was made for you and me This land is your land, this land is my land From California to the New York Islands From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water this land was made for you and me This land was made for you and me This land was made for you and me Good morning and welcome to our sacred space. We are the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart, a welcoming community, encouraging religious freedom, nurturing individual spiritual and ethical growth, celebrating diversity, and pr promoting a just and sustainable world. I am Mary Perrin, and I am a member of the board of this congregation. Welcome to each of you. Good morning and welcome to the morning service with the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart. My name is Amy DeBeck. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And it is a pleasure to welcome you this morning, whether you're someone who comes all the time or you've just started being with us during COVID. Um, really happy to have you with us. The first thing that I need to tell you is that we have lost one of ours. Rowan Sibley has died. The details of her service are still being worked out. We know that it will be Saturday, November 21st, not at UUFE. Details will come. We're holding in our hearts all of those who are ill or recovering, whether it is from COVID or something else. We lift up Karen Kerr, Noran Wynn, and whoever is in your heart this morning. We shift our focus at this time to Sherry Moline, who will ring our gong and light our chalice. We ring the gong three times, once for those who came before us and made a place for us, once for those who are here now, and once for those who will come after us and build on the dream.
as we light our chalice this morning, we remember our fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant.
This week, the two big ideas on my mind have been time and power. Technology makes building easier and faster in these modern times, but the point is not how long something will take, but how worthy is it of that time spent. How do we spend our time? How concerned are we with being, with living? How do we use our time? Time is always present on our minds. And power, power is on our minds. Who has it? Who does not? And where are we in the power structure? Time is often controlled by those in power. Capitalism declares that we must account for every minute because time is money. When power is with church or with a deity, then time might switch to afterlife and eternity. Racking up points in this life for the afterlife is not where a lot of Unitarian Universalist people find themselves. We believe more in making this life count. Time is important. We want to use it well. Knowing about who gets our time or what is a priority. Power and time, my reflections for this election week. One famous silly quip about time, but it's about power too, is that the length of a minute depends on which side of the bathroom door you're on. But really, time is just different for us in the 21st century. We're junkies addicted to immediate gratification. We're different than people centuries ago. While other ministers probably scrambled to come up with a message about democracy, <clears throat> I've turned to ancient history and to former self-important rulers to make sense of my current life. I recall reading about the terracotta soldiers years ago in an Annie Dillard book. About 50 years ago in China, two workers digging a well for water hit something hard where there should not have been anything but loose soil. And the rest is excavation history. Emperor Qin, the first emperor of China, became king at 13 years old. This was like 250 years before the birth of Jesus. He began the construction of his burial, burial grounds then. For the next, they estimate 12 years, using over 700,000 workers in an area covering unfathomable measurements, several square miles. There are terracotta clay. Terracotta soldiers complete with their horses, all sculpted, done to commemorate China's first emperor, who was only a boy with a vision at the time that the project began. Now a little background on that emperor. He united China, he began the Great Wall. He lived up to his self-importance by the time that his vision was complete, but of course by the time his vision was complete, it meant that it was a mausoleum and he was dead. But each of the soldiers in his army is unique and around six feet tall and on horseback. It's estimated there are 10,000 of them. He really thought he was important and he made other people feel like he was too. Author Annie Dillard writes of her experience of seeing them back in 1982. She wrote, there is at least this one extraordinary distinction of our generation, for it is in our lifetimes alone that people will witness the unearthing of the deep dwelling army of Emperor Qin, the seven or 10,000 soldiers, their real crossbows and swords, their horses and chariots, seeing the open pits in the open air among farms is the wonder, and seeing the bodies twist free from the soil. The sight of a cleaned clay soldier upright in a museum case is unremarkable. And this is all that future generations will see. 
No one will display those men crushed beyond despair. No one will display their loose parts. No one will display them crawling from the walls. Future generations will miss the crucial sight of ourselves as rammed earth. That ends Annie Dillard's quote. In her book, For the Time Being, she shares her account of seeing them in 1982 as they are still being excavated. They look to be swimming through the sand, half of them still covered. One gets a feeling for how very small and insignificant each person is, despite the fact of that emperor's own inflated self-importance. It is safe to say that nobody currently living on Earth will have a send-off quite like Emperor Chin did. It is also safe to surmise how very different we understand time now from how ancients used to understand time. 2,000 years? It's hard to even recall a decade, let alone an eternity. This week has been a study in how we treat the passage of time. Can you imagine somebody saying to you, hey, I got this plan, here's what we're going to do. Oh, and then getting it passed by all of the ordinances, right? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to clear several square miles and construct somewhere between eight to 10,000 soldiers so that whenever this politician dies, the army will protect him in his afterlife. I can't really imagine that. I think I know a certain ousted ruler who expects that kind of dedication, but I also think he's going to be sorely disappointed. Our modern minds cannot imagine time in such a way or this scope of dedication. Dillard writes about the finding of the soldiers, quote, the well diggers scraped away the dirt and, they and then they looked down the well hole at an unblinking human face. The area now under excavation is larger than most American counties. It made me think of the pyramids in Egypt and how we could ever possibly grasp the concept of erecting such a monument to greatness and to afterlife, let alone imagine it and then carry through with it. 20 years to build, 20 years of time passing, I mean, if anyone looked back on what I was doing 20 years ago, it would not have been that incredible. I'd never even been to Indiana 20 years ago. What were you doing 20 years ago? The pyramids, another guardian of another afterlife, took 100,000 slaves 20 years to complete. It is very interesting to compare our own modern human lives in our modern increments of time with the ancient view of accomplishments, such as building that army or building those pyramids. As we decide how to spend our time, we go about it however it works best for us. Sometimes we start with a goal, sometimes a goal emerges. But how do we know when we've met our goal? I mean, at what point did someone declare the job finished? At what point did we say, all right, that's the last soldier? At what point did they say, pyramid done? I mean, until somebody calls the vote, the returns are going to keep coming. Waiting for the outcome to see where the power will be placed is what we're all about. Our lives are like that too waiting for outcomes and endings. I think this is why the thought of afterlife is important in so many religions and to so many individuals. If we never truly cease to exist, it calms our fear of death. Annie Dillard said that Confucius wept. Confucius, when he understood that he would soon die, wept. Time. The time that we have now, the time that humans used to spend, and the idea of an afterlife. The sheer magnitude of all of those ancient projects and the time that they took overwhelm me. The difference between ancient understanding of time and our current state of being interests me. I recall a sermon I delivered once that got me in some trouble back in the day 
in another state, in another pulpit. I said that it didn't really matter when Jesus was born, in which season, whether it was in December around Saturnalia, or it was in April around Passover, because the facts are not as important as how we commemorate them. I said that Jesus himself would have been unaware of when his birthday was, because time is measured in seasons, not in days, and certainly not capitalist minutes. The part that got me in trouble was saying that we will never really know the facts, because we want facts in this modern world. In constructing these houses of God, we are also safeguarding our own eternities. We're taking some control over the spin of our own story. Deep inside, even the most spiritual woo-woo part of us, we know that there is that possibility that our story might end. If there are not buildings or plaques with our names or people who remember us, there is the fear that we could cease to exist. Each of us is very important and insignificant at the same time. Religion is one place that we can reconcile this paradox. But in speaking of an afterlife, how do we speak of time? If we cannot imagine 2,000 years, well then how do we ponder eternity? And more interesting to me is when we look backwards at time. You know, all of these conversations about when the flood happened, because it's a fact that the flood happened. If we can date Christianity to about 2,000 years ago, and Judaism another couple thousand years before that, well then, the scriptures that were written for today and for the future were still being written. Eternity works in both ways. The afterlife we await was also there back then. One cannot possibly write about or read about guardians of the afterlife without thinking about what do we believe. All through time, people have believed in something otherworldly, whether it's natural or supernatural. It helps us to believe that the limited knowledge we have of life is not the whole picture. There's got to be something more, right? Maybe someone who's more than merely human, or maybe we have elevated certain humans to a deity level. In doing so, we've all been concerned with the time that we're in, not with what came before, not with the uncertainty of what is to come. All we can do at any time in human history is concern ourselves with where we are, with our current understanding. Each generation thinks it's the greatest. Each person is important and insignificant. Each religion promises some way to cheat the nothingness that awaits us upon death. Every ruler did great things. Read their history. Qin united China, built the Great Wall, or at least started the building of it, built irrigation systems and roads, promoted literature, art, and math, but he also slaughtered thousands, maybe millions, who he disapproved of, including scholars and people who were interested in books. He burned books and buried people alive, but he got a whole army to guard his afterlife. Every time in human history has had greatness and futility while each life has also had greatness and futility. Humans cannot help but to ponder our being, and so then ponder the time when our being ceases. And these are the greatest reflections that we do. When we ask ourselves, what have I done? How will I be remembered? What happens after life is over? Am I doing everything I can right now? 
we sure have had a lot of time to think about these questions, right? Dillard says, there are no formerly heroic times and there was no formerly pure generation. There is no one here but us chickens. And so it has always been a people busy and powerful, knowledgeable, ambivalent, important, fearful, and self-aware. A people who scheme to promote, deceive, and conquer, who pray for their loved ones and long to flee misery and escape death. It is a weakening and discoloring idea that rustic people knew God personally once upon a time, or even knew selflessness or courage or literature, but that it's too late for us? In fact, the absolute is available to everyone in every age. There never was a more holy age than ours, and never a less. Thank you for being with us this week, and we always like to close with a benediction. This week, my colleague Maureen Killeran has closing words for hard times. She says, no matter how weak or how frightened we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may you do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong, be connected. Each day, act, so you may be a little more whole. Blessed be. Amen. Stay home, and if you go out, wear a mask. <laughs>